three, two, one. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Rick here. What does the future of work hold? And to answer that question, I figured, hmm, who better to go to than someone who's running one of the biggest human capital management software company product suites uh, out there. So we're happy to, uh, to welcome through the magic of WebEx. Joining us is Meg Baer. She is the chief product officer, SAP Success Factors. Meg, it's great to see you. It is wonderful to be here, Jeff. Thank you so much for inviting me. Oh, absolutely. So first off, just how are you doing? It's been, um, I can't believe it's been like five or six years since we sat down for that Women in Tech interview many, many moons ago. So how are you doing? A lot of excitement. You got this big promotion. You're, uh, you're right in the middle of this firestorm thing called COVID. Yeah. So as you can imagine, like everyone else, we are navigating COVID, but also really doing some exciting things over here at Success Factors. We've launched a new product category we like to call human experience management. And that is really where we're focusing on putting people at the center of business and thinking about how people can make a big impact for themselves and for business at large. So it's been really exciting times and a great place to be for me. Awesome. So let's just jump into it. So Obviously, you had to run your own company uh, with with everybody working from home and and sheltering in place and all the interesting challenges that that uh, brings up. But but more specifically, you have a lot of customers uh, that are using your software that suddenly were thrust into this situation. I'm just curious if you can share a little bit of of, of what kind of happened last uh, spring, some of the immediate um, kind of concerns and stuff you guys had to to overcome, and then we'll get into some more of the the challenges going forward and, and how are you looking at this really as an opportunity to re refine things? Yeah, you said it exactly right. We have a really interesting uh, vantage point, both as uh, leaders ourselves managing through this, but also working with CHROs around the globe in different regions, in different industries, how everyone has kind of been forced to change at a very quick pace. And then also how they're thinking about this as they're trying to navigate to what does come next. And I would say at the beginning, one of the really amazing tools we had this time outside of great technology to do a lot of things virtually, we also had great tools for running surveys very quickly and understanding what people needed. And early on in the pandemic, we found people's needs were very specific and not exactly what you would think of. It wasn't just about their technology footprint. It was about their chair. It was about their desk and how to be uh, you know, working from home when other family members are at home and all of those sorts of things. But as we've progressed, of course, it's come around well-being and sort of the long-term impacts of being apart from each other. And so as we look at the opportunity that all of that has brought forward is a real rethink about how do we connect better with individuals that work for us? How do we make ourselves more available to their needs as those are changing? And how do we think about this organically and systematically to make sure that we're being responsive to the needs of the individuals? Because the actual lived experience is very different while we're all suffering this pandemic, it has been coming in waves in different parts of the world at different times. And so this is another piece where you really have to get very local as well. Right, right. Well, I'm just curious too, how things have changed within your customer base as the realization kicks in, you know, April, May, June, July, August, that this is not a temporary situation, that, that there are gonna be some elements of this going on for a very long time. People have been working from plane trains and automobiles for a long time, it's not necessarily where they went first, but you know, people have been working from not the office for a while. But from your customer point of view, how has their request to you and their kind of functional priority changed when they realize this is not, I'm just enabling people to work from home, but I actually need to start investing to make that an option uh, for the folks that re really want to do that going forward? Yeah, absolutely. So a couple of things. I, I have an internal joke where I say that, you know, every time we try to get a, this is the plan to get back to the office, the coronavirus says, hold my beer. Because <laughs> I know that, you know, every time we think we understand what's going to come next, we, we realize we are just not sure. What we know for sure, though, is that our leadership has changed dramatically. And I don't just mean SAP, I mean around the globe, the definition of leadership. And so when, when you think about what becomes important in bringing people back to work safely, we wouldn't have two years ago imagined that we would have to understand vaccination status for everyone. And yet every single company in the United States that is working with any part of the federal government has to has to deal with that in, in several states as well. 
we wouldn't have thought that the way that we organized our facilities was going to change so dramatically. And yet every company is now grappling with how much real estate do I keep? And what does it mean to come back to the office? And how, and what is the reason people come to the office now in this state? So yes, it is about facilitating work from home. And we definitely have figured that out mostly because we had to, but coming back is a much more broad and deep set of questions that are really hard for organizations to get their arms around. And so what I've been encouraging companies to do and what they're in, in giving us ideas about things that they're trying is to really be a little bit more clear to yourself about flexibility, because at the end of the day, hybrid, as we're talking about today, is not an end state. A lot of times people are saying, oh, we're going to be two days in the office or five days in the office or one day in the office or fully remote or whatever. But at the end of the day, these are all interim states. And so what we really need to get better at is being more responsive to change and how we look at the entire dynamic of what does it mean to work. So that's either really exciting or really terrifying, depending upon your personality and your um, your interest in change. <laughs> right, both probably, right? Well, I, you know, because COVID, it's been said a thousand times, I'll say it one more time, right? It was an accelerant to a lot of things that were already happening and, and, and working uh, remotely and the ability to work remotely and the distributed teams was part of it. I'm curious from kind of the, um, a prioritization and, and maybe connection with with the other core systems and managing people. Because the other thing we have going on right now is this great resignation that everybody likes to talk about. But I think really is just that people took a minute, they got off the hamster wheel, they were forced off the hamster wheel. Really odd that 7 billion people had to change their behavior overnight. And, and I think people are being more thoughtful. They're being more, you know, kind of searching for more meaning in what they would do because because they get a break and, and they kind of saw the sun and maybe took a walk in the morning and spent some more time with the kids, maybe too much time with the kids. Um, so as you see that from kind of a functional point of view and 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 really thinking about engagement, um, you know, we talk about customer experience all the time. You talk about employee experience, work experience. It's been a little late to get back to the worker. It feels like you live it every day, but you know, everybody's been focused on the customer experience and not so much those people that are expecting that same thing in their engagement with all the applications they deal with with the company. You're exactly right. And, and what we know is that the power is shifting, right? And so I think organizations are feeling that when we talk about, you know, the, the construct of the great resignation, what we're really saying is that people have more choice and that is a moment to take stock. And so the way we like to think about this, when you think about systems, what, what we wanna do is we wanna really help bring the, the intrinsic motivation of people back to their work, because that's really what this is about. It's about, hey, here's my set of needs. Here's my set of gifts. These are the things that I am trying to, uh, to navigate in a way that works for both my personal and, and family life, as well as for the work and, and how I show up at work. And so what we what we recognize is that this is an opportunity. This is an opportunity for organizations to really embrace that flexibility, not just for the number of days you work and how you work, but really the flexibility of, of listening to your employees and engaging with them and to help decide and create this future. So what I mean by that concretely is I see a lot more of dynamic teams. I see a lot more of agile constructs coming into the broader business. And I see individuals grasping opportunities with a lot more authority and power. And so we look at that as the opportunity for how we're thinking about software going forward, but also how we're sort of supporting our customers in navigating this, what is a real power shift from a traditional command and control, very structured, very understood set of work to a much more adaptable, evolving, growing, changing form of work. And how to do that in a way that creates, um, you know, goodness for the individual, but also for the business. Do employers get that flexibility is a great thing for the people and that they are actually hiring adults and that they should be able to schedule to go to their daughter's recital from three to four on a Wednesday, even if they have a meeting at two and they have another meeting at, at, at 4.30. I mean, this. It, it seems like such a great opportunity to rethink that. And, and I, I love what you said, intrinsic motivation. I just had a post up the other day that's getting a ton of action. Uh, Greg Jones said he thinks most people are only about 60% engaged uh, at work. Uh, and, and, and the rest of that is because they're not intrinsically motivated. So it, it seems like a really great opportunity 
um, to change things up um, and, and, and to give people that flexibility so that you get that intrinsic motivation and they're more motivated and they sleep more and they spend more time with the family. When they actually do get work done, it's better quality work. Yeah, it's about being in flow. It's about being um, able to to bring your best skills forward and your best capabilities forward. So back to your question, do organizations get this? Um, this is not very scientific, but this is based on a lot of conversations. My hypothesis is is that at the a board and the and the C-suite level, they do get it, but it definitely gets lost in translation as you get in through the different levels of management. And so what that means to me is that that intellectually it's understood, but on the ground operationally, it's very confusing. If you're a line manager, if you're a leader, if you're responsible for, a, for an operational area and you have only ever seen that work with you managing by walking around and seeing people and watching them work, it's, it's a lot of upskilling and relearning for you to be able to say, hey, what are the pointers and, and the indicators that I look for that help me feel confident work is getting done. And so you're right, we've had a good opportunity to experiment and develop some of those skills, but I do believe that there's still, you know, change is complicated. And I do think that there's a little ebb and flow here in how people are adjusting, but there is a core group of people that were trained that leadership requires you to watch and, you know, pay attention to every single thing people are doing versus understanding that they're helping you and giving them more agency authority power and control and so it's the the skills and tools you need to do that as a leader are very different than what you had needed in the past and and there's some unlearning there for sure it's funny you said that i i had noted that in my notes that agency and value and interest keeps coming up in all your guys literature and and again i think it goes back to this you know um uh, Terry McClure says, you know, most of these people are fully functioning adults, you know, g give them, give them an opportunity, give them the task, give them the objectives and, and let them do their things. I'm curious if you're seeing that in the, in the way the software works in the way that they're managing or say, say an arcane, um, process like annual reviews, which is just the silliest thing of all time. And, you know, there's been movement on 360 reviews and, and I'm sure, you know, how, how are you seeing something like a, a, a annual review process that is, that is clearly so outdated. Uh, Absolutely. You know, kind of yes. And into this opportunity to rethink the relationship between, you know, the boss and the and the employee. Yeah, and even before the pandemic, there was a strong shift starting to to come forward where people were looking at making feedback more continuous because right growth does require feedback, but doing it in a way that um, was was much more closely tied to the work and the skill and the capability that you're developing. And so we we have been investing in that, of course, for quite some time. But now what we're looking at is even bigger than that. So we've just recently launched our opportunity marketplace. And what we're really bringing forward here is an actual dynamic, you know, bringing demand and supply together in a more coherent way, but doing it with the individual at the center. And so what we're what we're saying is, is, hey, it's the organization's job to make it clear to individuals what they need and what problems they're trying to solve. But it's but they should value the individual raising their hand and volunteering and wanting to be part of that. And the people that are going to be drawn to that will be the ones that become your change agents ongoing. And so what you need if you're going to think about making things more adaptive and more more dynamic is you need more constructs that bring that understanding together. And so because I'm a technologist, I believe what you really need underneath all of that is a data uh, story that creates understanding, not just understanding of what I'm doing, but actually understands more about me. And that's right. to something really interesting we're starting to think about, which is we call the whole self model. I'm much more than just a few skills or a pretty face or somebody that comes down to webcasts and, and has conversations. I have things that I'm you know, super passionate about and being able to understand more about that helps to create this opportunity for me to give more, to be more engaged, to have more to do. And how, how are you uh, calling that information? How, how are you pulling that information out? The, the, the softer stuff that, maybe is not so directly related to your job, but it's an important thing for me to know about you. Right, and this is such an important question because we know that 
there's um, there's a fine line between being understanding interesting things about me and being creepy, right? right <laughs> and so right. we really, really want to make sure that we're we're thoughtful about this. And we've been spending a lot of time on this, both with research and with um, you know actual customer interaction. But it just falls to this: it's important that there's a return on investment for me. And if there's something in it for me, then the rest of it sort of take care of itself. So what we want to bring forward is opportunity and transparency to the individual to participate more, to create more opportunity for themselves. And so in doing that, we're trying to be really clear about what we're using the information for and then how we bring that value. But to the specific question about how do you understand the, the, the more broad things about me, the things I'm passionate about, the things I value, the things that motivate me, et cetera. Um, there are a fair number of instruments that our organizations have used forever. A lot of people are fans of like DISC or, um, you know, the um, strengths finders or other sorts of things. We're looking at this in a, in a sort of broad way. And so we have some partnerships that we're developing to make it easy for our customers to take this on if they don't have um, existing stuff, but we also are pretty open to um, other batteries out there. But what we want to do is be able to make that useful to the individual so that the more we know, the better opportunities we can can make available to you. I want to shift gears a little bit. It's kind of tangential to that, but, but really talk about the application of AI, right? It's the most, the most powerful thing to happen. Uh, probably since a microprocessor, I don't know. It's it's a it's a big deal, and you guys, um, SAP purchased Qualtrics years ago, and you know you guys are using AI. So from a platform perspective, from a product head of product perspective, what gets you excited? What what does AI open up opportunistically that you just couldn't do before? You couldn't even roadmap it. Yeah. So there's a couple things. First off, the the scale and the ability to test and learn is is super critical, right? If you think about the the conversation we've been having, which is things are changing and they're changing at a rapid pace, understanding that and having the ability to think about that structurally is super important. But the other piece that's really important to us is again the the transparency and the clarity of how we're using data because we know that there's a lot of unintended consequences as well. There can be unintended consequences for diversity and inclusion. There can be unintended consequences for, um, you know, how people are left out of populations because anything that you do with machine data learning is tied to the data that you already have, which we all know already has bias in it by design, right? right? And so what we're what we're trying to do and be very thoughtful about is in is looking at it as an opportunity for nudges and better interactivity and better connection with the individual and less about it doing all of the work for you, right? So we, we do want the benefit of automation, but we also want the transparency so that we can have a better handle on what is the machine learning starting to understand about you and is that ultimately helpful or not to you as opposed to is that is that withholding opportunity for you somewhere else because we happen to know something about you that maybe you didn't want to share? Right, right. Because it's also is it valuable to to your customer, right? To to the employee, or excuse me, the employer. But I'm just curious. You know, I just saw something the other day about N NPS scores, and I'm sorry, I have a personal thing with NPS scores. I think yeah. it's I think it's a silly measure. I, I'm I'm you know, it's it's too many questions, and you run out of steam, and you have to put one or five on all of them anyway. But you guys are, you know, so you, you're trying to measure uh, employee sentiment and engagement, right? Clearly, your customers don't want all their people leaving. And, and you talked at the beginning of this that it was a real benefit to be able to send out surveys and quickly get data back. But I would imagine on the, on the AI side, you have many, 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 many more indicators of behavior and sentiment and likely, likelihood of leaving within a particular uh, period of time based on actual data of activity as opposed to asking them. So I, I presume you're using this, you're in kind of a nice situation yeah. where people have, you know, they're sharing their information with their employer in, in kind of a closed environment anyway. So you don't kind of have maybe quite the same privacy issues or maybe you do. I mean, maybe it's a little bit more complicated uh, story here than, than we really think, but the AI is there. You see every transaction that's going through the machine so you have a lot more sentiment analysis than you used to by a survey. 
Absolutely. So there's there's two things. We we have a lot of action and activity based on what you've done, but we but what we're trying to gather is more action and activity on what does it mean to you, and then also how does that um, how does that enriched by the things that you do. So again, what what's really becoming interesting is now everybody is is working from home and everything is digital. You actually are starting to collect a lot more things that can signal how and where you're spending your time, right? Because of um, the, that information becoming almost exclusively digitized. And so again, the way that we're looking at this is first off, making sure that we have the technology backbone to be able to do interesting things. Second off, make sure we have the transparency and the permission of the individual and that there's they they're really understanding what it is we're going to um, you know analyze and why and then to your broader point make sure that we use this understanding to help inform the organization of trends and pain points and opportunities for change and then more importantly after all of that we have to make it easier for organizations to take action on what it needs to be changed. Because again, if you if you if you have all this understanding that you know you've got this kind of ticking time bomb, but you don't have the organizational muscle to make these kinds of changes, if you if you're stuck and don't have the empowerment at the organization level to change how work happens, all you're going to do is just have really good insight to a lot of dissatisfaction. So what we what we're trying to do as well is think about the adaptability of what what's in the HR industry called service delivery, right? Like how does HR deliver services to individuals? What are those things that are important and how do we make that easy to adapt and change over time? Because again, if you think that it's this is a one-time thing, you're missing the kind of broader construct of what's happening. So there's right. a lot going on and it's um, it does advantage companies that have the ability to kind of look across and do things in a broad way. And that's something that I find interesting and exciting for sure. Yeah. You know, it's funny. We're both in tech and change is, is constant, but people people still don't grunt that this is a change, right? We're not going back to the old way. We never go back to the old way. This is this is never the way it's going to be for the rest of time. And we all get locked into this thing like we think this is the way it the story ends and it, it doesn't. Is. And I want to I want to shift gears and talk a little bit about kind of reskilling and, and employee investment because you know a huge thing that's changed again since the 1850s whenever we started this whole thing right is people don't go to school learn one skill and do that thing for 25 years and the technology's changing the requirements are changing the automation is taking over you know certain jobs certain tasks certain roles so how have how is kind of reskilling and training and education and kind of lifetime lifetime development of of people you know, kind of being factored in beyond just, you know, are they getting their benefits and, you know, can they sign up for their, their dental plan or an open enrollment? Yeah, exactly. So, so there's, this is a broad construct and, and let's be clear, like, again, since we're in tech, we've seen this pretty much the entire time. I, I remember within, you know, a few years of leaving university, none of the technologies that were taught at university were anything that was being used in the workplace. And of course that's changed only at a more rapid pace since then, because it's been quite a few years since I've left university. So, um, so this has been staring us in the face for a long time. And early on, we were very excited about, oh, we can do e-learning or we can, you know, um, expand courseware and, and buy off the shelf training and all of that. And, and absolutely that, that is important. And then, you know, as time grew on, we started to have tools like YouTube that our kids kind of just learn how to do stuff by watching someone else versus the stuff they're learning at school and all of those things, right? So those are things that we sort of think of in the traditional learning space. But we always have kind of instinctively known that really upskilling our workforce is also about doing, right? You can go to all the training you want, but if you don't actually practice a skill, you're not likely to be very um, proficient at it. And most companies, when they identify a skill problem, it's much bigger than a single training course or, or taking a bunch of people and, and putting them through some sort of boot camp or workshop or whatever. They need, they need a whole path that helps them practice that skill. And then they need a way to turn that into something that's structurally beneficial for the company. Because if a company is saying, I've got a reskilling problem, it's, it's pretty significant, right? It's not just a onesie twosie little thing, right? Right. 
And so this is why we're starting to think of the broader construct of learning to be much more about this idea of temporary assignments, like trying things out for shorter periods of time, talent mobility, moving people around that have the skills, and then bringing them together with others in teams, forming dynamic teams that can either be used as like seed teams to you know, share and grow a broader population, or come together to solve that problem that you needed the skills for in the first place. And then really thinking in terms of how do you think about um, training as something that you, you may start that journey with formal training, you may then do some practicing, some getting a team together, whatever, but then that team itself might be responsible for creating the training for the, for the rest of the company. We've done this already multiple times, but we've never really thought of it as part of that upskilling story and so now we have this opportunity to really rethink, again, putting people at the center of it instead of like shoving it down their throats from an organization, having them co-create it for you, right? presenting them with the problem, not the solution, offering to give them some formal training if that's helpful to them, but also pairing them up with a mentor, pairing them up with a team so that they have a chance to develop the skills the way we've always developed skills from the beginning of time, which is apprenticeships and you know you know and 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 working with masters right like these are the things we've always done but somehow we just gave that up and said oh I, I, e learning will fix it i think it's part of the change in the attitude too and in, in people as resources versus people as people um and and not calling it the chief human resources officer and not thinking of them as as a, as a piece of steel or or a, a, a pile of cash or a truck that you use as an asset in the business and deploy right they're people they're complicated they're messy. They're not. They're they're not clean. They have a lot of things going on. And you know, I wonder. And you, you touched on it a little bit in terms of how that gets baked into software. That, that that you are dealing with people at the end of this thing. You know that they're not. They're not really resources, and they're not super clean. Like you said, you can't just jam a bunch of training on them and they suddenly take it. It's a lot more nuanced and and um and and tricky static. than that. So how do you how do you get that in software? Yeah, so the, and and they're not static either, right? Like so who I am today is not who I will be next year, God willing, right? So right. so again, when you think about it, software is actually really good at this. Software is good at understanding lots of things at one time and and um automating and and responding to a lot of things without it being overwhelming. Where software breaks down is when it, it is designed to solve a specific problem. And usually in, in the past, you know, HR software was was there to help HR's job get better. But we're not talking about making HR's job better, right? What we're talking about is making work better. And then if you want to think about making work better, you really need to think about how do you do that in a way that really respects what the individual brings and recognizes them as a dynamic entity as well. And so this is where we see this concept of the whole self model coming to play, because it's not just who I am today, but it's who I am becoming, who do I aspire to be? And how do I find that to bear more fruit in this organization than somewhere else? Because right. that's really what you start talking about when you're talking about agency is that I have, I have a vote, right? I have a vote of what it, what's important to me to use my skills and what and where do I want to be? And so the better job an organization can help facilitate that, the longer I'm going to stay, the more I'm going to bring value to the company, the better it's going to be for both of us. And so that's really what we're trying to think about. Right, right. Well, then, and then you're, you know, you're talking about trust, which is the most important thing of all. And, and, you know, interestingly, right, HR departments, I think, are viewed as ultimately they work for the company. And even though they're trying to help out the the employee, you know, ultimately their responsibility rolls up to the to the corporation. Um, but as you said, companies are now realizing they can't do that so binary and just completely discount the value. It's a competitive marketplace. Uh, you, you know, it's it's a very different way. So is there are you seeing and the way people interact with the applications, are you seeing the companies try to find better ways to build trust and drive engagement? And, and you know, just begs the question, how are they actually measuring engagement? Yeah, so we have in the past, um, probably for the last 10 years, thought about engagement um, as 
usually companies did a, a large annual survey once a year to say, how is everybody feeling? And then maybe quarterly pulses to see if anything is, um, is changing dramatically. And I do think that there will always be a place for that kind of sort of formal benchmarking a company tries to do to say, you know, how are we versus last year? But I think we all understand that when you have so many different things changing, it's hard to say, well, are people disengaged because of something the company's done or just what's going on in their lives right now? It's it's sometimes very hard to deconstruct that. Um, and again, I think it's the bigger challenge is the drawing the through line to what changes you're making as an organization and why you're doing it. And this is where I think, again, leading companies right now are are really investing not just in the the construct of of getting that feedback but also empowering their organizations to make changes more frequently and then really there's a big communication element to this how do you make it clear to people the the changes that you're making and why and how those are directly tied to the things that you're learning from the individuals. And so, again, I think the better that we get at these thinking of it as feedback loops, as opposed to survey and just action, I think it's really the way that it, you know, that the best companies are really looking at it. And, and, and then clearly there's a, there's a diversity angle here as well, right? Because, um, you know, everyone doesn't have the same setup at home. Everyone doesn't have broadband. Everyone doesn't have a spare room or even a, 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 a corner. Uh, to get their work done that's quiet. So, you know, the impacts um, from the diversity and inclusion in thing has been pretty dramatic uh, as well. How are you guys seeing that on your side? It's huge demographic elements. People with children under 12 um, see the world very differently and have a very different perspective of wanting to get into the office <laughs> than people with kids that are uh, in school for long periods of time or out of the house for longer periods of time. Um, so that again, I think the, the lived experience really matters. And I think we all know this instinctively, but in the past, it's always been very separate, right? I have my lived experience, the crazy chaos that's happening at home. And then I have my work experience. And what I'm really hopeful for is that we have come to learn that, that the, the value is in the humanity and that we do need to problem solve how to make it better for people who have small children at home and really want to get out of the house. And we do need to problem solve for um, single parents or people that are taking care of um, sick family members or any of these kinds of conditions because we can. And in the past, maybe we couldn't. Let's be fair. Like maybe in the past that was just sort of socially and organizationally too complicated. But what we've learned is we absolutely could do something about it now. And because we can, I think this speaks a lot to people speaking with their feet when it comes to their, their jobs, because they know it's a solvable problem. It's complicated, but it's solvable, and they need to go to a place that will help them solve it. And so I think organizations and certainly HR leaders are, are really feeling this viscerally and trying to figure out how do they navigate this overarching understanding of the the you know our lived experiences change pretty rapidly and over time but there there are points in our lived experience where where we need to go further in or further out from how we contribute at work well-being and and kind of our emotional state matters and that, that our emotional health matters as much as our physical health and we should be able to have open conversations about that and have affordances and and plans in place to help people when they find themselves struggling and then recognizing that we have more choice than we we give ourselves organizationally and to and to really own that that we should be more creative i love that and, and do you think people get that i mean do you, do you think i mean they did it i mean if you would have told people on march 1st guess what i bet you can get your entire workforce working from remote in three weeks right they would have said no free but they did so i mean it really opened up uh, I think people's eyes to what's possible if you just, if you have to, right? I mean, you can actually move pretty far, pretty fast, pretty quickly. Yeah, I, I am really inspired at not just how much people get that, but also how creative and interested people are in trying to think more, more creatively broadly. 
But like any big change, I also am seeing a fair number of people saying, no, oh, no, 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 we got to go do it the way it's always been done. So, you know, there's going to be tension, but I do think we've expanded the definition of the possible and I'm excited about it myself. So I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about you and your journey. And again, for those that, that weren't paying attention, we first met, I think it was in 2015, uh, for a women in tech interview, you were at Oracle back then. You've been doing this for a while. You're super engaged in a number of women in tech organizations. You speak frequently. You're you're all over the internet, which is fantastic. And and congratulations. Recently, uh, apported to the to the board of Hydrogen Struggles. Um, so I wonder if you can share a little bit about you know kind of your experience, and more importantly, kind of what's changed you know from from 2015 to now, and and even more. You know, has anything changed from your perspective in the last 18 months? Yeah, so first off, I, I should thank you again that that Women in Tech interview was at the very beginning of my um, recognition that I needed to do more public facing things. Um, I had been on that journey a little bit. I'd started out with a fair amount of blogging and, you know, industry stuff. But I hadn't really spent a lot of time in the broader sense, having conversations that weren't tied to my products or my business or or things like that. And um, it was it was really on purpose. So it was fantastic timing that you you invited me. But it was also a moment that I was saying this is a place I I need to be investing more. And I feel very compelled, as we talked about then, of being you know, owning the fact that I'm a role model, there's not a lot of women in tech, you don't see a lot of these conversations from the seat that I have, and really wanting to make that more accessible and available to people for people to see that there's nothing that special about me, um, and that they can do it too. And I really wanted to, um, to be more visible in that, in that way. Um, and as far as the hydrogen struggles thing, that's a huge, um, Thing I'm so excited about. So it's a new learning for me. I, I'd been purposely looking for a, a board seat. In a, when you have a big job like mine, it's it takes a, a fair amount of time. So I knew I was only going to be able to do one. And I'm just so excited to find a company that has, first off, it's it's got such a similar line of sight into the kind of things I think about and um, want to understand all all day long because. They are also a very uh, focused on human capital and people and and leveraging talent. And um, the the group and the organization is a place that I know I'm going to learn a lot, which um, inspires and makes me happy. So it's been it's been really wonderful. Yeah, good for you. Um, you know, I talked to Robin Matlock years ago. She used to be the CMO at VMware and they did a small they called it VM Women at VMware again forever ago. And she said, you know, I never really paid attention. Cause I was just busy, you know, just doing my thing and raising my family and, and working up my career. And it wasn't until she got a little bit more senior where she thought, you know, I, I need to, I need to be a voice. I need to be a face. I need to, you know, kind of represent women because, you know, ultimately it's for the, it's for the younger girls to look up and see people that look like you and look like Robin and look like, you know, people that they can recognize and see themselves uh, in those roles. So I think it's, it's such an important thing to do and you know maybe it's a little uncomfortable now and then but but super uh super important so good for you but i'm curious on the hydrogen struggles kind of the what's the the view at the at the upper echelon you know their conversations about um you know the covid impact on the future of work yeah so um you have, first off the the sort of business of change is uh, is one that they're they're very directly um connected to because leadership changes, um, you know, they're, they're the people that you look to when you're thinking about leadership changes, board seat changes, et cetera. And um, so that's why I say there's this really good learning for me in taking in that broader market perspective of where are the dynamics happening and reinforcing things that I've already learned with our global customers, which is, you know, that talent really matters, right? And it's not, it's no surprise. Um, great, great talent is what drives business outcomes. And um, yeah, it's just, it's just been really delightful to be part of that organization and to have experience at the board table to talk about business and um, decisions that are critical to business. So yeah, it's really good. That's great. And so important. I mean, I, I, I think leadership, especially at the top, at the highest levels, right, is really about convincing people to come on your journey, 
right? Yeah. And not go on somebody else's journey, whether that's whether that's a customer or a potential customer, or an employee, a potential employee, partner, potential partner, investor. You know, it, and and as a leader, it's so important to be out front in storytelling and, and and getting out ahead of these trends and being empathetic to what's going on in the market. So it's great that you're that you're there. I think it's a very different skill, as you said, than to being a taskmaster and 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 kind of a task manager versus, as you said, where do we want to go? Set a path and then you know get get out of the way and then help people, you know, achieve that path. A very different you know kind of way to think about people. Uh, in your organization. Definitely, they're not resources, that's for sure. Yeah, humans first, absolutely. And I think that that is the core, you know, I, no matter what, as as you spend more time on this planet, you become kind of more grounded in, in that reality that at the end of the day, um, humans matter to all of the things that we're, we're doing. And the better that you respect that, engage that, connect with that, it's just, it's just the better that it's going to be for for all sides. And so I, I really feel that that empathy, curiosity, putting yourself in their shoes, understanding the problems that people are trying to solve, giving them better insight into the way that you look at it, your own thinking about it. I think these are the places that that create outsized power in um in getting things done. And so this is why I'm so excited about dynamic teams because when you bring people together, to really so solve a problem, you get that collective intelligence, you get that broader understanding. And it is in that collective intelligence that the interesting things are solved. And when that collective intelligence is diverse and has multiple backgrounds and multiple perspectives, guess what? You're probably gonna come up with something that's much more creative as well. Right, right. And to your point, intrinsically motivated, right? Because they're, they're, they feel part of a team. You know, People like to do things for their team members more than they like to do it for themselves. So, I mean, so much power wrapped up in that. So that is awesome, Meg. Thank you for uh, for spending some time and good luck baking all this very important stuff into software because these are going to be uh, interesting times going forward. And you guys are sitting right on top of that really intimate relationship between the employer and the employee. Yeah, it's about making work better. So I'm excited to do it. All right. Well, thank you very much and uh, have a great day. All right. Thank you.